Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. Welcome back to Biochemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, I wanted to do a quick overview of some of the medications that you might see in cardiac pharmacology. So let's start with the statins and we'll look at the mechanism right here. So statins act by inhibiting cholesterol synthesis. So let's look at the very basic setup of this pathway. So to synthesize cholesterol in the body, which is done in the liver, the body starts with acetyl-CoA. Now again, this is done in the liver and it's a multi-step process to get from acetyl-CoA to this chemical called HMG-CoA, which is beta hydroxy beta methyl glutaryl coa now there's an enzyme right here which turns out to be the rate limiting and the committed step in cholesterol synthesis. This is HMG-CoA reductase. Uh, physiologically the body regulates this enzyme tightly so it's also the prime target for a drug uh, to intervene at. So HMG-CoA reductase converts HMG-CoA into mevalonate. And then mevalonate is, con is converted via many, many enzymatic steps into cholesterol. This is probably something like 30 steps. It's a lot to make cholesterol. And then you can see cholesterol, while in the liver, is packaged into uh, VLDLs and sent out for transport through the blood. Initially, the VLDLs will give up fatty acids to cells like adipocytes, also skeletal muscle, any cell that needs fatty acids. And that transforms the VLDL into an intermediate density lipoprotein, or an IDL. The IDLs return to the liver where they're slightly modified into what's called an LDL. And the purpose of the LDL is to take cholesterol to peripheral tissues. And so for example, here's a cell of a peripheral tissue. And if this cell needs cholesterol, whether it's for steroid synthesis or its cell membrane, it binds to a specific type of receptor and is intaken into the cell via receptor-mediated endocytosis. And that's what it's supposed to do. However, in pathological states, remember LDL, especially in high sugar diets, can slip between endothelial cells and get into the intima layer of the vasculature. And in there, if there's a lot of reactive oxidative species, LDL can be oxidized. If you have hyperglycemia, it can be glycated. And so that LDL can be modified into an oxidized LDL. And of course, that will lead potentially to atherosclerosis. And so the idea behind statins is that they inhibit this enzyme hmg coa reductase. If you inhibit this enzyme, everything downstream decreases. So cholesterol synthesis decreases. LDL output decreases, and then in theory, the LDL oxidized decreases, or modified LDL decreases, and then the risk of atherosclerosis decreases. So that's the action of statins. Now we also have these other cells. We have liver cells called hepatocytes. We have the beta cells of the pancreas, and then also skeletal muscle cells. Now let's suppose we're dealing with an individual who has diabetes. We might see the sulfonylureas. So the sulfonylureas act on two cell types. One's the liver, the hepatocyte, we'll come to that in just a minute, and then also the beta cells of the pancreas, which we know make and secrete insulin into the blood. It turns out that in order for the beta cell to make insulin, it's dependent somewhere in its pathway on this ATP-dependent potassium channel. So if you want more insulin, simply further activate this channel. It turns out that sulfonylureas activate this channel, the ATP-dependent potassium channel, which leads to more insulin release. The other thing that sulfonylureas do is they go to the liver and decrease LDL output. If there's less LDL output, then there's less of a chance for it to get oxidized in the intima by reactive oxidative species, and glucose, and so that theoretically will also decrease the risk of atherosclerosis. Also in diabetics, we might also see the use of biguanides. So biguanides act on two cell types. They act on the hepatocytes, and then also just generally peripheral cells that might be using glucose. A great example of that is skeletal muscle. So the first action of biguanides on the hepatocytes is they reduce hepatic glucose production which reduces blood glucose. If somebody has diabetes, they may have hyperglycemia. One way to manage that is by decreasing the amount of glucose that's made by the liver. 
We know that glucose is made by the liver via gluconeogenesis and released into the blood. Through their mechanism, biguanides interrupt this process so that there's less hepatic glucose production and therefore less blood glucose. The other thing that biguanides do is they improve insulin sensitivity in peripheral cells and increase glucose utilization in any cell that uses glucose. For example, skeletal muscle. So in diabetics, particularly type 2 diabetics, they may have impaired insulin sensitivity. Biguanides also act on peripheral cells. They improve insulin sensitivity and they increase glucose utilization in any cell that would utilize glucose, which is the vast majority. So here's a skeletal muscle cell that's a great example. So they improve insulin sensitivity, which is, of course is more important in individuals with type 2 diabetes. So they simply allow the insulin receptor to be upregulated, so there's more insulin receptor and therefore more insulin sensitivity. They also increase glucose utilization. Remember, glucose can be catabolized to make energy, ATP. And so they allow more glucose to be utilized by these peripheral cells. The fourth drug type is the GLP-1 receptor agonist. Remember with the beta cells of the pancreas, one of their jobs is to monitor blood glucose and then release an appropriate amount of insulin to counteract it. But when we take up glucose orally, there are cells of the intestine that can also monitor this before the glucose even gets into the blood. And so if we take oral glucose normally, the intestine will release GLP-1. GLP-1 is a hormone that travels in the blood very quickly to the beta cells of the pancreas, binds to a GLP-1 receptor, and also allows an increased synthesis and release of insulin. So a GLP-1 receptor agonist is a drug that binds to this GLP-1 receptor on the beta cells. And when it binds to this, it triggers the release of more insulin. So this is a way for an individual with type 1 diabetes to get more insulin from their beta cells. Now one prerequisite to using a GLP-1 receptor agonist and sulfonylureas is that the individual has to have some pre-existing insulin synthesis and release. It'll be diminished because it's type 1 diabetes, but as long as they have some and those cells are not completely obliterated, they will be able to make more of that insulin. Hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of some of the drugs that are used in cardiac pharmacology. We'll pick up with this in the next video and talk more about the ones that deal with clotting factors and platelet adhesion. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.